Good afternoon, everyone watching online here in the Philippines and worldwide. Welcome to the Public Sector Productivity Webisodes. My name is Gerard Calambro, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon. Let me introduce my co-moderator, Mr. Enzo Arenieta. Good afternoon, Sir Enzo. Good afternoon, Sir Gerard, and to all of our viewers. All right, so we would like to give a shout out again to the participating agencies this afternoon. We have the Office of the Ombudsman in Quezon City, the Department of Social Welfare and Development in Bicol Region, the National Bureau of Investigation in Manila, the National Library of the Philippines, the Commission on Higher Education Regional Office in Tacloban City, the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation in Cavite City, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, the Philippine Sports Commission, the University of the Philippines in Los Baños, the Department of Education Division of Sikihor, the City Government of Alaminos, Pangasinan, the Professional Regulations Commission Central Office, the Philippine House of Representatives. We also have guests from the Cultural Center of the Philippines and the Bangsamoro Liaison Office in Metro Manila. So good afternoon to everyone. So here at the Development Academy of the Philippines, we believe that we play a vital role in nation building by helping accelerate the transformation of people and organizations. And as an effort to stay relevant, we are conducting this webinar series on knowledge management to serve as a venue for learning the different tools and frameworks that contribute to policy and program formulation. So yesterday, we had a lecture discussion on the principles and processes of knowledge management in the public sector. So today, we will highlight how KM is practiced in the public sector today. Without further ado, we would like to welcome again Professor John Del Rosario, our resource person. Mike thank Monster. you, Gerard. Uh, All right, thank you, Enzo. So good afternoon again, everyone. And nice to see that you still join us for the second day. Again, we're going to be together for the next hour. But as mentioned by Gerard earlier, this time we'll focus on the practical side of knowledge management, okay? Meaning um, we'll focus more on the dynamics of how knowledge management is indeed applied in organizations, particularly in the public sector. So the webinar is an online lecture discussion on how knowledge management is practiced in the public sector or particularly how it is used or how it is applied in organizations. So the practice of KM centers on assuring that knowledge is used or applied, shared, and retained by those who work for and interact with the organization. That's a very simple way to put it. When you say that you're practicing KM in your organization, you're doing these things. You're actually using or applying whatever that knowledge is. So there, there's no one set of knowledge that you need to apply, but it depends on the organization that you have. And aside from the application, aside from the use of knowledge, you should all be sharing knowledge. Again, uh, it's not enough that you use or apply knowledge, but you also need to share that knowledge. And more importantly, you want to retain that knowledge because the exercise is futile. The exercise is worthless if you're going to lose that knowledge eventually, especially if at the start of your initiative, you identified certain knowledge needs and you tried to acquire that knowledge and finally acquiring it, you only lose it after using it. Uh, it's important that that knowledge gets to be retained. So remember that use or application, sharing and retention, okay? It revolves around managing the environment and processes that enable the use or application, sharing and retention of knowledge in the organization. I think we already mentioned this yesterday, especially when we defined what knowledge management is. And we said that you don't directly manage knowledge because at the end of the day, it's the people who actually use, share, and retain the knowledge. Although in terms of retention, you can actually convert certain pieces of knowledge into explicit, something that is documented or recorded so that you can put it in the organization's repository, database, portals, or whatnot. But the, the main functions of sharing knowledge, the use of knowledge, the application of knowledge are definitely done by people, not the organization. The, the, the people work for your organization and it's the people who make this happen. Uh, the idea there, uh, as we define what knowledge management is, 
we said that you manage the environment where that happened and even the processes involved in that environment. That's the best thing that organization can do. Manage the environment and processes where knowledge is applied or used, shared, and retained. Knowledge is a tool for decisions and action. This clarifies the idea that you don't get all types of knowledge. You, you don't acquire whatever knowledge is out there. You discriminate. You, you have to be deliberate in your choice. Of course, the starting point would be the, the knowledge needs of your organization. So if a particular knowledge is not really going to be that useful for your organization, meaning it can be used to make decisions and actions in your organization, then you don't pay attention to that particular knowledge. That's why KM varies from one organization to another. All organizations have different needs for knowledge and they make different decisions, different actions. With regard to the practice of knowledge management, you can take a look at the following. First, you look at context management and KM audit at the right side of the screen on top. With regard to context management and KM audit, well, KM initiatives have to start there just to make sure that you're actually identifying the correct knowledge need, the correct knowledge that is needed by your organization to make sure that you just don't pay attention to all types of knowledge, as we said. It has to be sorted out. It has to be filtered. So you focus your effort, you focus the resources, initiative of your organization on those knowledge needs. That's why you have to do context management and KM audit. The context management will describe to you both the external and the internal environment of your organization. Whatever is happening inside, internal, and happening outside, external. And whatever you gather from this, what we call environmental scanning, you come up with a KM audit. So given what you found out in both environmental scanning for both internal and external environments, KM Audit will help you identify the knowledge needs of your organization. Then uh, this knowledge needs have to be connected to the strategic level or what we call strategic thrusts of the organization. That's why we have their next strategic KM, just to make sure that KM is truly integrated into the entire organization, then whatever knowledge needs are identified in the first domain, the context management and KM audit, they have to be connected to whatever strategic thrust of your organization. So when you say strategic thrust, we're talking about the vision, the mission, the core values, the strategies of your organization. You don't really need to come up with a specific, especially if your organization doesn't produce knowledge. The idea there is that what we believe that the, the mission, the vision, the core values, the strategies, the actions that you need to make in your organization should be knowledge-based. Okay, So that's why these things have to be connected to this strategic thrust. Of course, it cannot stay at that level. It has to go down to the operation level. That's why the next domain is the operational KM, as you can see from the screen. So the that means after incorporating or integrating the strategic level of knowledge, now you're going to be doing the same. Knowledge is going to be integrated into the operations of your organization. Usually that's the case. That's the natural flow, right? You come up with a strategic plan for your organization and this strategic plan has to be cascaded down to the different work units and these different work units are supposed to come up with their operational plan. So if knowledge is already incorporated, the knowledge needs that you identified are already incorporated into the strategic plan, naturally the same knowledge needs are also going to be incorporated in the operational plan. So that's something automatic. The next one is, as you can see, KM technologies. This is more like the tools. As we said, we're not necessarily saying that technology is a requirement for KM. But nowadays, especially with the digital era, technologies have to be used. It makes KM easier, faster, more reliable, more effective. Of course, the problem with technology is you have to really invest in the technology. So you have to choose carefully what technology can work for your organization. The next one is on the left side, we have performance management. It's a concern. It's a good uh, domain in performance management because remember, I think we covered yesterday saying that people usually ask the question, what's in it for me? So just to make sure that they really embrace, they really accept knowledge management. It has to be connected to the way they perform. So it has to be connected to their jobs. It has to be connected to the way they get evaluated, their performance. It has to be incorporated into the way they are rewarded, promoted. So we want knowledge to drive your performance management. I think that's what the Civil Service Commission is trying to push now. Organizational learning. We mentioned this also yesterday that, well, knowledge management cannot exist without learning because it starts there. Knowledge starts with 
learning. And knowledge continuously grows because of learning. And the reason why we have knowledge management is because of learning. It came out in the 90s. So back in the 70s, uh, 1970s, 80s, there's no such thing as knowledge management. And who knows in the future what we're going to be having. I'm trying to put this idea that having a, an intelligent organization. So I don't know if it's going to be the next evolution of knowledge management. But the organizational learning component should always be there. And then finally, we can also take a look at innovation management. We also mentioned yesterday because every now and then organizations need to innovate. You don't do that all the time, right? It makes the organization unstable. But if opportunities are presented to the organization, then you have to get into innovation management. And even ISO, I mentioned, as has already come up with a innovation management series starting with ISO 56000 to 2019 although they finally decided that organizations can also get certified to innovation management that's why they're developing the ISO 56001 to get for the certification but anyway and I think I already mentioned this yesterday the newest program at the graduate school here at the AP is about the MPM KM and uh, these are the major subjects if ever you plan to enroll in that program these are the subjects that you will encounter in the program so there will be specific subjects on each topic but there are other specific topics in knowledge management okay and project management because ideally when you propose KM it has to be a project first not to really trial and error but you want to first find out if it works for you or not and the reaction the, the response of your employees the, the people in your organization how they're going to be reacting to your initiative. I included KM project management there. And many times this initiative, this project, start everything. It's important that consultants, when they help organizations come up with KM initiatives, they start proposing a KM project and they should have knowledge about project management. More often than not, KM introduces changes. That's why I believe that those who are involved with knowledge management should also have some background on change management. Actually, it's not only for knowledge management, but other initiatives. More with knowledge management, especially if what we call the KM culture is not yet developed in the organization, there will be a lot of uh, roadblocks along the way. And a change management will help you circumvent those roadblocks because we know that knowledge management is important. And after, you know, designing everything, conceptualizing everything, then there's this roadblock and then you won't continue anymore. That's a waste of time, waste of effort, waste of resources. So might as well be, have a way to manage those change concerns because in general, people uh, resist change. ICM or, or intellectual capital capital management. There are certain schools in the country like the University of Asia and the Pacific. They already have something about intellectual capital management. Okay, so it's very much related to KM obviously, but it's not really a, a very distinct field. I believe that with intellectual capital management, the emphasis is more on investment in knowledge and how you can measure how can you value knowledge the valuation of knowledge and i think that's very important because aside from the question of people that what's it for me as answered by the performance management in this case for top executive top management they will say that, okay so what will it cost us usually for a cost benefit analysis so being familiar with intellectual capital management can help you navigate this uh, very messy cost side of km and of course, R&D, we already mentioned this yesterday, many private sector organizations have their own R&D. And of course, the main function of their R&D is to create knowledge, innovation. Next is uh, at the left side, we have intellectual property management. In case you discover that certain knowledge that you develop, certain ideas can be patented. As I mentioned before, ISO has already created a series on innovation management. So there's a specific ISO on intellectual property management. We have a colleague from the Graduate School of Public and Development Management. He works at the intellectual property office and he said that, yeah, that's a very good idea, marrying knowledge management with intellectual property management. Okay, Of course, information management has always been there. Well, knowledge management, before the advent of knowledge management, people were more obsessed with information management. But later on, they found out that information management was very limited. But uh, we're not dropping it off. We're not removing it from the scene, so to speak. Still very important because, well, especially new knowledge, it starts with information, right? And how you use that particular information. And we're talking about sharing of knowledge, right? So there has to be a concern for organization 
organizational communication. And when we talk about organizational communication, it varies in the organization, depends on their protocols, depends on their processes, their structure, so on and so forth. But I later found out when um, there was one consulting assignment I, I was working on, and then there was a problem with communication. So I, I think at that moment, I failed to recognize the communication getting in the way of uh, knowledge management, especially when we start talking about knowledge sharing. So now I'm including it, although in some disciplines, they may say that organizational communication is a different concern, but still related to knowledge management. And then this one is very important, competency and capability development and management. We want KM to be part of the organization. We want KM to be part of the people. And in order to do that, knowledge should be well, should drive competencies of people and capabilities of the organization. So when you do competency, capability, development, and management, always include the needed knowledge to be acquired so that there will be some direction. In fact, that's the logic of doing competency and capability development and management. Management, it's the knowledge. It has to start there to make it more meaningful. Okay, at the right side, you can see KM evidence-based management, metrics, and analytics. Okay, so, so many fields are into metrics and analytics. So KM is not far behind. KM is also into metric and analytics more than anything else because we said that knowledge is a tool. And in order to justify the value of the knowledge, the knowledge should produce the results. Otherwise, knowledge cannot produce the results, then the knowledge is not important. So the results is in the form of evidence, especially when we mentioned earlier the intellectual capital management, you want to evaluate, measure knowledge, then you have to get into evidence-based management, metrics, and analytics. Now with the advent of the ISO 30401-2018 or the knowledge management system, I am predicting it's going to be like a separate practice on its own, just like with the quality management system or QMS 9001, to the point that many consultants are are practitioners of ISO 9001 and not necessarily practitioners of quality management. Now with the advent of uh, this ISO standard, in the future, it could be a very separate domain of KM. But of course, we know that it's still part of knowledge management. Although certifying registrars are not yet available for this, but uh, the standard is available at our local Bureau of Philippine Standards, BPS, at the uh, Hill Puyat Avenue. And I think it's already adopted as a PNS. It's not that expensive anymore. So if, was, if you want some idea about ISO 30401-2018, you can buy that particular document. E-business and business computing. Uh, with the use of technology, and especially for business, they want KM to be a source of competitive advantage. So you have to get into business computing, right? But even without that concern, with the digital age, many transactions, many processes are being done online. So we're in the era also of uh, e-business. So it's still part of knowledge because it's very knowledge intensive. E-business is very knowledge intensive. Then you have the computer-based technology and information and ICT. Again, it uh, reflects the role of technology in the AM. And then on the left side, we have documents and records management. What is not recorded, what is not documented in the organization doesn't get retained. If a particular knowledge is so important for your organization and you fail to document or to record that knowledge, then you will lose it. I'm not saying that you document, you record everything. That's why from the start, it has to be clear on your mind which knowledge is important, which knowledge you don't have to pay attention to. So zero in on those knowledge so important to your organization. And those are the things that you have to document, make explicit so that it gets retained in the organization. Organization. And there's such a thing as knowledge-based entrepreneurship. In my case, when I do consulting, training, it's based on uh, knowledge. <laughs> okay, so I put up my best test. So that's the entrepreneurship part. And I share knowledge. So people are, in a way, clients are buying my knowledge. So it can be a good source of uh, business. I remembered when I took my master's in technology management, we have a particular subject on technology-based entrepreneurship. In, in that case, your business is about a technology, how you create that technology, how you offer that technology to clients, so on and so forth. So I thought perhaps it could also work with knowledge. Knowledge can be marketed, right? Why not? The thing is, I don't know if I'm going to say that they should start regulating it because it's undervalued. It's like you have to negotiate your fees, so on and so forth. Of course, the clients will always tell you that it's going to be lower as opposed to software vendors. Softwares are in the millions. But with the knowledge that I'm offering, it seems that the software is more important than the knowledge. So that's the thing. But if it's regulated, and uh, of course, you cannot anymore go up or lower with the uh, rates, right? But 
at least there's a recognized valuation of what knowledge is. So if it, if you look at in the stream of having a business out of knowledge, I have yet to see, well, you can consider the consulting, the training as a knowledge based business, just like with, with the AP, yeah? but of course this were free. So we're not really selling, but we're providing knowledge. Okay. And then KM system thinking it's the framework I use to develop the MP and KM. It's a very simple framework. That's why I always uh, include it in my discussion and gives you a very good view of what knowledge management is. And it's the theme of the MP and KM in the graduate school. These are the different domains of practice, which I hope you didn't get bored <laughs> while I'm discussing it. Although some of them are not separately being practiced by practitioners, by consultants, and there are very few consultants on KM right now. But eventually, I hope in the future, it will catch fire. We just recently concluded this certificate course in the Foundations of Knowledge Management. In fact, we're going to have our graduation this Saturday. We already have like a 60 plus or 70 plus since last year who have some background now about knowledge management. And it will be more. Hopefully by next year, we're going to offer our third batch. And starting this November, we're going to have the MPMKM, which means we're going to have more practitioners into KM. Some new concepts, since we're in the digital era, talk about digital workplace. You're working in that context when you look at knowledge management. Perhaps it's the reason why when we started the Knowledge Management Association of the Philippines or KMAP in, at the turn of the millennium, my early 2000s, it did not really take off. Well, because we're digitally undeveloped. Nowadays, it's a lot easier to apply knowledge management because the workplace is becoming digitalized. Especially now with the pandemic, many organizations, especially government agencies, are forced into digitalization. Otherwise, people won't stop going to the office. However, you say that they should work from home. The only way that they can do work from home, that the, their workplace should be digitalized. Okay, uh, there's this good concept, working out loud, W-O-L. Working out loud is like you are actually narrating to your colleagues what your work is. In a way, you're sharing them. When you, when you do job rotation in your office, people actually go around and occupy different positions, do different jobs, and then you try to learn the job. But in working out loud, you don't really have to do job rotation. It's just that whoever is the expert in doing that job is going to narrate to you how he or she does his or her job so that you get to learn. But the thing about working out loud is, for one, it has to start, start with him or her being an expert on the job. Second, if he or she can really articulate, can really express, communicate what he or she is doing. Or he or she is willing to share what his work is, what her work is. But uh, many, uh, some organizations already find this very useful. So it's like uh, doing a narrative or narrating to colleagues your work. And then the, the idea about community of practice, I think you've heard that before, has now moved into community management because of the presence of so many communities of practice. Again, the thing about communities of practice, since it's very voluntary, right? If it's not quote unquote managed, it will die from its natural death. But the thing is, if you really uh, ironic about it, if you directly manage it, it will also die. It will lose the spontaneity, the free flowing discussion. And, and, and I think there are, there are many tips, advice here with regard to community management, especially you're talking about uh, communities of practice that are vital to the organization. And if your community of practice is electronic, and this easier done. And then cognitive computing and artificial intelligence. The idea here is that KM should be the basis for doing cognitive computing and artificial intelligence, not the other way around. The idea there is at least the type of knowledge that people need is the one incorporated in the computing and the intelligence. Now you're familiar with this, the analytics and the business intelligence, especially for private sector companies, they do a lot of business intelligence. Enterprise social networks like Microsoft and Workplace by this. Actually, I always hear before the pandemic that Facebook is not allowed during work time, but we know that it's a major source of communication. So they thought preventing people from using their Facebook will make them more productive because they feel that people, when they do Facebook, they're not productive. But uh, we know that it's very integral to our personal life and even our professional life. So here in this case, uh, there was this uh, set of students from batch two 
just recently included the certificate course that they're really using Facebook and they're using it for the community of practice. I told them, oh, at least in your case, you're allowed to use the Facebook. Before it was not, but for them, they found it difficult to start communities of practice. So when they allowed the use of Facebook, it was a lot easier. The opposite now is true, is uh, how to control the community of practice because there are so many ideas in the communities of practice. Then chat tools, of course, people like the idea of uh, Viber, Messenger, Telegram, Slack gamification and digital badging. In this case, it's all about, there are video games. We're in the like same city, we're in, you're in a virtual world and you interact as if it's the reality. And then if you need to meet, you have your own avatar, you meet. So in other words, if you want to display something or illustrate something, it's so easy to draw it on the computer because you're part of the virtual world. And uh, if we were talking about adults, we know that adults still want to play. like. Before the Clash of Clans, now it's the Mobile Legend. I don't know if people are now moving into LOL, LOL, that's League of Legends, I think. So. If you can introduce that in your workplace, instead of having this notion of people being unproductive because they're playing, but I think it's the opposite. If people are playing, they are more productive. And besides, would you believe that a long time ago there was this unheard of, but now there are many jobs that are looking for gamers or master gamers, so they pay. And then the agile technology, meaning a set of uh, technology that you can use for any type of KM. Although, that, of course, I think that's more expensive, especially if you're talking about the wide range of using such technology. As we said yesterday, you're applying it from the start, identifying the need, the knowledge needs, and until the retention of the knowledge. So if you can find an agile technology which covers all those processes, that's what we meant by agile technology. And I think you're familiar with this, the mobile apps, and the bring your own device. Again, that's another thing. We should allow our employees to use their phones. What's wrong with that? Because it adds to the productivity. It's just a matter of trusting them if they're going to be working or not working at all. But if the work is really knowledge work, you can easily check if he or she is productive or not. Because with knowledge work, it's in the output, it's in the results. Okay, there's this started by Dr. Leif Edvinson, one of the gurus in KM back in 1996 in Sweden. In his company, Scandia, he came up with the idea that having a future center or innovation laboratory wherein there's an area where employees can go to and then uh, think, come up with uh, ideas about solutions, about innovations, and then report back and then try to systematize the study, so on and so forth. And then back in 2016, we, come, we came up with our own with the Development Academy of the Philippines. We call the PSP or the Public Sector Productivity Innovation Laboratory. We make use of the co-creation innovation model and design thinking. In fact, there will be like a lecture. I think I mentioned this. Next week, we're going to have a, for our innovation lab, we're going to have a lecture on how they run the innovation lab. And they use co-creation innovation model. And then they also use design thinking. If you want to learn more. It's very good. Here's my take. I don't understand at first why do we need to do this, having a future set of innovation lab. So, because I, I thought it's just encouraging people to think. So do you need to say when they're in their respective workplaces, they cannot think? Well, the idea there is that they cannot think because if they do nothing, just stare at the wall or at the good view of their office, it's like not working, not, pro not being productive. So you know, there was this article before in Japan. There's an hour devoted every day for people to, to go to any spot and just think for an hour, nothing to it. The only requirement is that whatever you think, just record it. But I believe that thinking should be something automatic as you work. And how can you interpret people not being productive when they are not moving around? They're not signing papers. They are not attending meetings. They're not talking to people. When they're just staring at the wall, sitting quietly behind his or her desk, so on and so forth. But uh, the, the, the essence there is that it's all about thinking. These are the contents of ISO 30401 2018. Still what we call the high-level structure, if you're familiar with the term. Because I think back in 2015, ISO tried to standardize all its standards. To make it easier for integration of the different standards. So they follow the same outline or sections. The only difference, of course, would be the contents. So they follow the, the scope, normative references, terms and definitions, context of the organization leadership, planning, support, operation, performance evaluation, and improvement. So the standards are set. Now, in our case, it's just a matter of looking for uh, accredited, qualified, certifying registers so that for those organizations who are interested to get certified to ISO 30,401-2018, may do so.
And if you want more information about this, as, as I mentioned earlier, you can go to DDI, uh, particularly the Bureau of Philippine Standards, and purchase a copy of the PNS. So, what is Knowledge Management System or KMS? Why did I repeat the contents? Because I just want to emphasize the difference. Before ISO 30401, the notion about Knowledge Management System is a simple information system, IS. So, organizations think that it's a matter of uh, automating, it's a matter of digitizing contents, digitalizing processes, so on and so forth. And that's it. It's already KMS. But with the advent of 30,401, the knowledge management system concept takes a whole new meaning. It involves the way you look at the organization, your organization, both the external and internal aspects of the environment. Okay? And then your, the role of your top management. So how they plan, set up policies like that. And then the support processes that need to be performed, how you run your operations, how performance gets evaluated, and the importance of continual improvement. So, in other words, with this new idea about KMS, the scope of KMS became bigger. It's now wider in the sense that it's not only limited to having an information system. So, when you have an information system, you can consider that as you're having a KMS. It has to include all of this. This is how I see it. If we're going to um, take a look at KMS, uh, how it is really used, okay? So you start here. I came up with my own model. We have to start with the logic that, and if we're going to follow the logic of uh, so 30,401, it starts with your stakeholders, your interested parties, your clients, your public. What do they need? What their expectations are? What is the mandate of your organization? What are its vision, mission, core values, strategy? You start there. And given all these things, what are the knowledge needs? What do these things need in terms of knowledge? How you, and then how, how you, you apply this knowledge needs and then try to see if your organization do have this knowledge because it's either you already possess this knowledge or you don't. So obviously, if you possess this knowledge, it's a matter of locating where this knowledge is. But if it's not, then you have to find a way on how to acquire such knowledge. But the knowledge may not be existing yet. So you have to create your own knowledge. After which, of course, uh, you have already identified that this is the knowledge that you need. It's just a matter of applying it to your original concern. And then going through the organizational processes of your agency. Of your organization you should produce the results with the necessary evidence and of course these results this evidence have to show have to be connected to the satisfaction of this uh, original needs and expectations of your stakeholders the the, the law that i made was was very uh, accountable accountability driven in the sense that you start with the stakeholders and you end up with them but the key component is, uh, I think I already mentioned this yesterday, the organizational and the personal aspects of the processes. And we said that it's so easy to establish the organizational processes. The more difficult part are the personal. We're talking about different people in your organization, right? So they have their own way of uh, managing their knowledge. It could have been very simple when you look at the personal processes you start with knowledge what the person has in terms of knowledge or what knowledge needs if the person doesn't have that knowledge yet so that person has to learn that knowledge and of course if it requires changes in him changes in her then he or she should do so easier said than done of course it depends on the person and we're talking about several people if you have a bigger organization you're talking about thousands of uh, hundred thousands of uh, employees with varying knowledge learning change equations okay i included this because these are the considerations when you introduce it's still part of my framework as you introduce km in the organization the you have to use it as, as a project first right i said so you, you come up with an inception background singling out the different technical requirements operating requirements some cost estimates, and the possibility of what you're trying to propose. Of course, the same concerns like any other project, the quality, the cost, the time, and the lessons learned, or whatever new knowledge will be produced from, from such project. And then, uh, we already mentioned this, you also have to be concerned with change management because definitely there will be changes 
the organization has to make, your people have to make. So you do forceful analysis, identify which are supporting the change and those who are resisting the change and try to work it out uh, in such a way that you can uh, respond to those resisting. And then you have to go through the process of change from unfreezing, changing, and refreezing as prescribed by Kurt Levin, the German psychologist. These are the different KM tools. Most of them are very simple. We have knowledge mapping. Uh, this is one of my favorites in the sense that with knowledge mapping, as you do your environmental scanning, you have to move into knowledge mapping because the environmental scanning will point you to the knowledge needs of your organization. And to be able to know if you have this knowledge or not, you have to do knowledge mapping because in knowledge mapping, you're supposed to locate the source of that knowledge. Brainstorming is just idea generation. So still a very good game tool. In Knowledge Cafe, it's very much similar to the brainstorming. It's just that in Knowledge Cafe, you start with a very the entire group. Okay, Then you post the problem, the, the questions, the, the issues, and then you break them down into breakout groups. And then they work on the concerns, on the issues, the problems. Then, then they go back to the plenary documentation and recording that's very straightforward record 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 it's always been a integral feature of knowledge management lessons learned that should not be difficult to do it becomes difficult because people are not used to doing it but it's just a matter of writing down what you've learned is that difficult so if you don't write anything that means you didn't learn anything it's just a matter of making it a habit it's difficult because we don't do it but lessons learned uh, is just a matter of writing them down. And then later on, you're going to have a meeting to review the, the lessons learned. Okay? Of course, you're familiar with the knowledge portals and repositories. Of, uh, ideally, they are electronic. And then training. Don't forget that training until learning application. If you just stop at training and you didn't find out how the learning was applied in the workplace, then it's not part of KM. So you have to move until learning application to make training part of KM. Otherwise, it's just HR or maybe it's just compliance or something. And then coaching and mentoring, you're familiar with that. Competency and capability development, I think you're also familiar with that. Job rotation, really understanding each other's job. Advanced search tools, okay, you know that, like the search engines. And then expert directory, listing down both internal and external experts in your organization and then the contact numbers are there okay so that you can easily locate them and call them up or talk to them if you need information or if you need their knowledge okay community of practice i think you're familiar with that and then storytelling yeah storytelling is a casual conversation like the narrating na narrative as i mentioned about the working out loud but many believe that this is very effective because people like very good stories so make sure that if you're going to be doing storytelling the story is good okay so the chronology is should be perfect okay so those are the different tools and there are so many i just distilled the different tools because we don't have the luxury of time okay these are some good practices when i do consulting in km okay so organization is i, I said it's good practice not best practice right because I haven't compared it to other practices or to other consultants. Okay, organization is ISO 9001 2015 certified. ISO 30,401 2018 is nice to have. I find it very easy to apply knowledge management if uh, the organization is already ISO 9001 certified because the processes, the system is already organized. It's already in place. You should not encounter problems there with regard to the sequence of the processes, if the processes are documented, so on and so forth. Per the performance management system of the organization is competency-based. We already explained that yesterday. If the organization's PMS can be competency-based, uh, it's competency-based, then anyway, I believe that if people are not competent in your organization, they have nothing to share. So the, the fact that your organization has a competency-based PMS goes to show that you have competent people, okay? Top management 
is the KM champion. But usually, that's not the case. But I would have it that way if I can only have it. Yeah? Just, just a wish list. This one is good. KM champion is from operations because that person has a, you know, an overview of the entire organization. He or she knows what's happening. HR unit enjoys credible reputation throughout the organization, not just an administrative support thing. Um, because usually the KM initiative is lodged into the HR. And if the HR doesn't have that image to other units in the organization, it may be difficult for you to, to have them follow their lead. Training and development or courses or programs are year long and yearly. So many times I hear that organizations scrap their training because they don't have the budget. Can you just imagine if training can be scrapped, can be removed, what more with knowledge management? Resources, especially financial, are no object to the organization because, well, it doesn't have to be really that expensive, but you need resources to make KM work in your organization. So be ready for it. You should have the budget. You should have the, the financial resources. Entire organization undergoes KM training, not only a selected few. Otherwise, even if you do echo, cascade, uh, training, uh, my many details are lost along the way. So better that if you're serious about knowledge management, and of course, if it's going to be done for the entire organization, which should be the case, then everyone should attend uh, the same training. And then retention and design, turnover is low. What is low? 33%. KM is about knowledge, okay? And we're talking about people. If people keep on leaving the organization, then knowledge also keeps on leaving the organization. So I guess it's not a good idea of having a very high turnover rate in your organization. Organization is small, although there's nothing we can do if you have a very large, including management, preferably located in the same building. I learned that KM is a lot easier to do if they are located in the same building. But more often than not, if they have more than 100 Employees, of course, they'll be located in several buildings, especially they, if they have so many facilities, right? So KM Consult is brought in as early as initiative phase. It only happens to me once, but uh, I had a bad experience because I didn't like the way it was started, but I cannot change it anymore. So I, I ended up uh, not doing it at all because it's so difficult. And of course, the client won't agree that we have to start all over again. For me, I, I didn't answer my question, but they should have continued with the previous consultant and not bring me in. KM Odes is done before everything else. Yeah, it's the starting point because you, you need to ground your initiative. And we said that it's a matter of identifying the correct knowledge needs. Okay? KM consultant is retained until KM matured. Ideally, but if it's Many organizers feel that it's already so expensive on their part, so they let go of the consultant. Okay, these are just good practices, which I hope you, you, you learn something from, but these are not requirements. But this will make your KM initiatives easier. Here are the challenges. Environmental scanning, because there's so much to learn. Okay, But it's an imperative. You have to do environmental scanning. The same thing with context analysis and identify the knowledge needs. These are difficult things to pinpoint, to describe and all, but you have to do them. It's a challenge, but they're needed for the KM initiative. Authentic commitment and involvement of top management. Just like any other initiative, you need top management to be hands-on, much like with ISO 9001 2015. Immediate uh, provision of resources, including staff, technology, and finance. Well, the, the, the project won't move without the resources, obviously. And there should, there should be time for from everyone to, to be involved in the KM initiative. Uh, there should be knowledge sharing culture. Uh, I, I think I mentioned this yesterday that in ISO 30,401-2018, they devoted an entire section on knowledge sharing culture and how to develop it, what to, what to do, but it's a long process, okay? Compliance to RA 10173, 
uh, or the Data Privacy Act of 2012. The law still takes precedence, however difficult it is. But by, by, by this time, you should already be compliant to the Data Privacy Act. So everyone must be on the same page as far as scale is concerned. Otherwise, you will you will find it difficult to get support. Okay, thank you. That ends my presentation. All right, thank you very much, Sir John, for that informative and up-to-date presentation on the practice of knowledge management in the public sector. So now we move on to the question and answer portion of our webinar lecture. Um, let's start with our first question from Mr. Derson Cassiano. Is improving or refuting something in the public sector a form of knowledge or is it not? Like for example, if you disagree with something, uh, is it a form also of knowledge here? Depends on what you are refuting. Because uh, many times I find that people refute a particular statement and that person is when, 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 you, when you look closely in what the person said, it's just a matter of uh, negating or saying the opposite of what the other person said. So that's not knowledge because, I don't know, because it's, when you say knowledge, it has to be based on something concrete, something very well thought out, uh, it's factual, so on and so forth. So, but uh, with, with refuting, let, let's say, ah, uh, the criminal is guilty, then I'm going to stand up and say, the criminal is innocent. And that's already knowledge. I don't think so. <laughs> so uh, mere refuting is not enough. Depends on what you are talking about. And at the same time, uh, it has to be a deeper analysis. There has to be a deeper analysis to make it really... There's nothing wrong with you know, refuting. It's just that where it's coming from, the motivation behind it and what you are refuting yes i agree sir so refuting just without the data or the proof mm. or a basis mm. why did you refute the statement yeah. it's not enough so i think it should be backed up by data oh. or proof. Kasi ang dali lang na, hey you're wrong because that's already knowledge just then when you when you hear the person saying that where's the new knowledge there where's the knowledge so i i don't i don't get that part Yes, I think they, it should be backed up by data or yeah. rational proof to mm. refute a statement uh, mentioned yeah. by a person. So right. next question, right. Sir Enzo. Okay, our next question comes from Ivan Layag. Uh, they say, good day. Uh, KM is a requirement under ISO 9001-2015. And uh, what documents can we show during the accreditation audit to show the establishment of KM in our agency? So I think the heart of the question is that, enough. There's a requirement, but they're not sure what type of knowledge management products, proof, no, to say that they are doing knowledge management. No, diba? <clears throat> uh, diba, there's this particular section on ISO 9001 about organizational knowledge. And as we learned yesterday, organizational knowledge is explicit knowledge in the organization. Organization that is already retained, like uh, operations manual. That's already organizational knowledge. And in ISO 9001, you dictate what gets audited. You don't really have to scamper and, you know, look for... Because it's only a particular section of uh, ISO 9001. Whatever you have already documented, and this represents how you, how you do your work, how job gets done in the organization, that's organizational knowledge, the job description the strategic plan. Right, so for the next question, uh, Ms. Alicia Soledad is asking, what are considered as knowledge management products? I think maybe this was mentioned already, but maybe she's still clarifying what kind of materials can be considered as a knowledge management product. Operations manual. <laughs> no, no. Um, operations manual and then some employee handbook. There are so many knowledge products, especially if your organization is heavy into research and development, because when you talk about knowledge products, you produce the knowledge. So you cannot claim your knowledge product as a memo from, from Malacanian because it didn't come from you. Whatever you have already documented and they are needed in your operations, they are needed in the mandate of your organization. 
that's your knowledge product. Thank you for that, sir. Uh, our next question, ano, I combine these questions, sir. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Ms. Maria Mylene G. Laririt. Uh, she asks, uh, what are the disadvantages of knowledge management system? And then the other person asks, uh, Amariza Carabido, uh, are there any risks in knowledge management and how to uh, manage them? So parang ano, risks and disadvantages yung pareho po nilang tinatanong. Well, I'm a perfect na system. So we always say that there are always uh, advantages and disadvantages. On the part of knowledge management, people may be turned off. Some people are not really open in sharing. So it may turn off certain people if he, he or she found out that in that organization, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to share this, I have to share that. Uh, a very clear risk is um, you're, 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 you're sharing your knowledge, but it's not the entire knowledge. I mean, it's not complete, especially if we're talking about tacit knowledge. So you only know the knowledge. So people rely on you solely to find out what that tacit knowledge is. So if you claim expertise, there was a colleague of mine in quality management, and he said that many times if uh, consultants claim that they are experts in that area, when they claim, then they are not experts. So, so what I'm saying is, uh, it depends on the person if he or she is willing to share the knowledge, and the risk there once he or she shares that knowledge, it could not be complete knowledge. It could be it could be the wrong knowledge it could be knowledge based on not on facts or it could be got, it, it, it was obtained from another person he or she stole it so on and so forth if we are working on that assumption the recipient of the knowledge now has to do additional research to find the authenticity of such knowledge all right, thank you, sir. So we have also a question from Mr. Ryan Jose Kalubad, and he's asking, how has KM been working in the public and private sector? What are the best practices as well as the challenges in both sectors? And what best practices can be adopted and can be learned from each other? Uh, so he's asking if the KM management is already included or practiced in both the private and the public sector and what each sector can learn from each other, sir. So what do you think, mm -hmm. sir? Being a practitioner in both the public and private sector, being a resource person for both sectors, sir, what experiences or best practices have you learned from them and what can they share with each other, sir? Mm -hmm. um, in the public sector, it's always the case that KM is directed from above. There's that strong prescription that, hey, we're going to indicate, we're going to KM. In, in that effect, the rest of the organization, the entire agency, have no choice but to comply. So in a way, that's a, that's a way to start KM, right? That I don't, I don't see that in the private sector. So I think that's what's lacking in the private sector. Because what I found out in the private sector, uh, very competitive, very competitive. So, but the thing about the private sector, they can easily make the changes to make KM work. Okay, meaning when I tell them, uh, okay, you have to incorporate uh, KM or the use of knowledge in your performance management system, the way you evaluate people, the way you reward, the way you promote people, the way you incentivize, so on. So, so the, that's the difference, I guess. So, in the government, the directive from above, which causes everyone to follow, so no questions asked. If you don't want it, just leave the agency, right? You cannot resist top management's direction, right? For a private sector, they can easily change. They're flexible enough to change. Like we're talking about, we had a meeting today. You can see the changes happening next week. That that past. The government is so slow to the point that I had experienced like as if it's not happening anymore because they haven't made the changes yet in the government. But in the, in the private sector, they're very careful because uh, their employees are very competitive and they can easily transfer. If they don't like the idea of knowledge management, I don't like the idea of sharing my knowledge. And now there's a threat of sharing my knowledge 
to your competitors. And they, they can uh, grapple the neck of the company. That's the thing. So I think it's a good, it, it should be a both. Because, okay, uh, we might ask, okay, uh, since the direction from above is from the public sector, so why, why don't top management use uh, the same directive to make change? I already experienced like some of them stop there. They don't make the change anymore uh, because, I don't know, suddenly they don't care. Or the, the second reason is that there are many intricacies, there are many complications uh, because of this RA, because of this uh, IRR, because it's difficult. There's so many, and, and, and uh, the, the, the site, the, the citations, the, the reasons I cited are very external to the agency. Okay, sir. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Ms. Hazel Lu Shudal. How do you mitigate the differences in interpretation? Ano? So what she means by interpretation is what you should know versus what you understand. She frames this in a way that, especially since that agencies should have a standard operation procedure in their processes. For me, if we're talking about SOP, there shouldn't be any misinterpretation or different interpretations because these are SOP. They should be detailed enough not to be misinterpreted. I mean, that's the essence. And unless we talk about broad policies, like why do we keep on debating about the Constitution? Because it's such a, such a broad document. Practically, it's all-encompassing. That's why if you, if you invoke the Constitution, you can always be right. <laughs> As opposed to when you say uh, the IRR, the, the, the certain laws, certain... They're very specific. So there's something wrong with your with your SOP, if there's still different interpretations. So I guess it's in the SOP, not in the interpretations. And I think, oh. and I think during, we can have like a forum with the employees and, and try to allay this uh, confusion. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you for that. So, sir, thank you very much, sir Del Rosario, for discussing the practice of knowledge management in the public sector in this afternoon session. So to all of our participants, Please be reminded that in order for you to receive the certificate of attendance, you must attend all of the three episodes and submit the daily evaluation form. On behalf of the Academy, we would like to thank everyone for watching and we hope that you learned a lot from day two of this webinar series. See you again tomorrow, 2 p.m. Philippine Standard Time for our third and final webinar for this series, Knowledge Management in the New Normal, the Philippine Department of Health's experience with none other than Undersecretary Enrique Tayag only here on the PSP webinar. So again, see you again tomorrow for our last day. And thank you, Sir John. Thank you, Sir Enzo, for watching and to all of our viewers. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Enzo. Thank you.